This is episode one of the outsourcing series, discovering what your strength is within your business. Giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. So welcome to Toolbox Talks on the Site Shed. And today I'm joined by two very special guests and um, a couple that I've been extremely uh, looking forward to having on the show, Warwick and Michaela from the Tradies Business Show. Welcome, folks. G'day. Pressure now to uh, <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit funny being at this end of the interview. Yeah, man, I have to say. I'll tell you what was really funny. Actually, we um, with our when we interview people, one of the last questions I asked them is, "Oh, who would you like to see on the show?" And um, when I interviewed Clinton from TradyPad, who I'm, who you guys know, uh, Clinton yes. turned around and said, "Oh, I'd like to see Matt Jones on the show." I was like, "Oh, okay." So I, I didn't really expect that curveball to come at me. So <laughs> in, in order for me to appear on my own show, he had to interview me. So that's that's kind of funny. That'll be coming out in weeks oh, to come. Cool. But, so yeah. you actually did it, mate. I did it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Nice work. Jury's out on how it how it went, but we'll we'll let, we'll let the audience be the judge of that one. Yeah, yeah. The downloads, I'll tell you, mate. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, um, first, I just like to say, great work, guys, on the podcast. And for anyone that is listening to this podcast and and hasn't heard yours, I would thoroughly encourage them to head across to Tradies Business Show in iTunes or Stitcher. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant uh, business show, and um, I listen to it all the time, get a lot out of it. So, um, good job on that, guys. It's really, really going really well. Thanks, Matt. We just. Uh... Hey, we just turn up, have fun, and uh, <laughs> I was going to say we make magic together, but that that sounds a little bit inappropriate. <laughs> we, we, we better clarify we are not together in any other type of relationship. Yeah, just podcasting, just podcasting, and people do ask us all the time, but no, it's it's we don't create magic except on a on the us. show. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's it. We do have a lot of tiffs about stuff. <laughs> yeah. We do, and, and, we, and we quite enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. we are actually trying to find more things we disagree about because yeah, we know our audience love it so uh we're trying <laughs> nothing like a bit of, nothing like a bit of conflict huh? yeah i was gonna say nothing like a good punch up on air yeah good so look i've invited you guys on the show today because um i know you guys were both operating a business formerly which was uh tradies va which specialized in uh, outsourcing for tradies um and that's obviously quite a big um topic so um in in this short series we're going to put together with you guys we're going to cover off on three Three main, main main areas of outsourcing. Firstly, we're going to talk about discovering what your strength uh, in business is, um, and then we're going to talk about developing processes that can replace you, and then we're going to talk about building a power remote team. So, obviously, outsourcing is a, is a massive topic. You know, why why have we decided to speak about uh, these three topics specifically, folks? Well, I guess uh, for me, it's a big passion area for me is outsourcing and productivity. And that can really be achieved for this market quite easily. And I think there's this perception that's really hard to let go and they don't know my business like I do and I'm on the road all day. You know, how can I have people that don't sit in an office or I've never met actually help me run my business? Right. So there's this concept around that it's so hard to do and that it's going to take them so much time to train someone and unless they're sitting with me or, or you know, can answer my phone in my office, it's never going to work. Mm-hmm. And with technology now, which I know on your show, you talk a lot about cloud technology and, and being on so mobile now that there's so many more benefits to being able to outsource rather than actually, you know, employing someone and having all those headaches and yep. having an office and all that. So I think this is going to be a big trend this year in that a lot of businesses now that they're uh, working mobile and they've got the technology side of it, they're going to be able to look at other ways that they can save some costs and outsourcing, whether that's local or overseas or just using more contractors generally generally in their business, can really save them a lot of time and money. Excellent. So it's something that we're on a mission to dispel the myth of that it's difficult and, you know, no one will ever know my business like I do. So we're, yep. we're all about changing the perception out there. Okay, well, that's great. So why don't we just dive into the, the first episode here? Um, what we're going to talk about now is discovering uh, what your strength is within your own business. Now, I know Warwick, within your coaching business, I'm sure you would have a lot of exposure to people trying to be trying to be everything to everyone. Let's talk about the role of, you know, knowing what you're learning, what your strengths are within your business. Yeah. And it's something that as Michaela was just talking about outsourcing and the importance of it, uh, I was standing here thinking, and you know what, tradies and uh, business owners, you can't do it all. Like mm-hmm. you just can't physically do it all. So obviously when, you, when you're going to choose what do I do, what do I retain or, or you know, take on is as you say, Matt, work out your strengths. And I think predominantly what I've seen with business owners, the best thing 
or, or the best use of their time and the most bang for buck return on their time investment is generally in business development. And that probably falls into a couple of different categories. Most people, when you say business development, they think marketing and sales. And look, in the early stages of a business, and I'm talking, you know, five years or less, or certainly in the early stages of the growth path, the person who is most passionate about the business, who is the best one to be speaking to alliances and potential customers is generally the business owner. And I see too many business owners try and outsource the sales and the customer attraction stuff too early in their life cycle. And, you know, you, to, to get a good salesperson on, it's going to cost you a lot of money for a really good one. And then you're giving up that profit basically um, for yourself. It's funny though, isn't it? I mean, I have a, a client base down in Melbourne. They're a, they're a building company and they've got quite a, well, now especially they've got a relatively decently sized operation. And the turning point for them within their business was when the director actually made the decision that he was not going to be the CEO. He wanted to be out there on the tools with the guys and actually running the projects. Yep. Yep. And as a business grows, you start to get those luxuries quote unquote, where you can <laughs> specialize your labor, I suppose. But and it, and it depends, you know, for people listening, you, you, they'll all be at different stages in their business life cycle. You know, there might be some sole traders there. You might have people with bigger team. But, but I think it's, as you say, it's working out uh, what your strengths are, not what uh, the, you know, the biggest money saving thing you could do with your time. And and again, I see so many business owners that they do their own book week, book work and bookkeeping. They're paying their own bills, running their own payroll, uh, you know, ordering parts, all that sort of stuff. Even even quoting and estimating, you know, it's one of those things that often have to prize from people's hands is doing their own estimating. It's not necessarily the best use of their time. So within, I mean, using that as an example, if you are, say, an, a builder and you know, you're, you're out there pricing the work, how do you hand off those sort of tasks to somebody that may not have your level of experience in understanding what they're looking for, you know, structural specifics, all that kind of stuff? Like, is it, how, do you, how do you actually outsource that task when it takes so much, like years and years of training? Well, again, you know, generalizing, I suppose, one way is to either employ or, or subcontract to somebody that can do it, who has the experience. Now, that might cost you money, might cost you good money, um, but you've, you've always got to be asking yourself, what else could I be doing with this time yeah. and what value will that bring or add to my business? So if you, if you keep running out of time to go and generate relationships with architects and you know, designer drafts people that are going to refer you great work. Well, that's the thing that's actually going to shore up the success of your business, not sitting up until 1am pouring over takeoffs and plans so that you make sure that you price the job correctly when really that's a systemized thing that you can outsource to somebody else. Yeah. But but the the fear and the pain is that, yeah, but I'm going to have to pay someone, you know, 120 bucks an hour or 60 or 70 or even $80,000 a year to do that job. But if you win one decent contract off your activities of, you know, getting around and, and um, getting architects to fall in love with you and you've paid for that three or four times over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So- and there's another great example, a more lower end that I always love to give. There was a client that I worked with that uh, was a sole trader and the business was struggling. So he spent three hours designing up this image to use on social media about a new package that he wanted to introduce. Now, that took him half a day and it wasn't the best result, but it certainly wasn't the best use of his time. Imagine if he'd spent those three hours following up quotes or ringing real estate or ringing potential strategic partners. Yeah. That that could have, because he didn't want to outlay the money, but you know, he lost so much money. If he was worth $100, $200 an hour, you know, that was $600 worth of his time that he probably could have got done for $10 or $20. Yeah, yeah. With a better result. So it's about going, how else can you use your time to build the business and not with low end, you know, ad mini designer things that they think that they're actually saving money by doing it themselves. Yeah, okay. Or maybe we'll dive a little bit further into that in the following episode where we're talking about, you know, developing those processes that can replace you in those specific scenarios. So, I mean, what are some of the characteristics typically of, of, of people that are trying to be too much in their own business, trying to be too much to everyone? Uh, they're probably pretty stressed and they don't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> they work extreme hours, never take a holiday, work they're, every weekend. They're called 
the 99.7% of business owners, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I, you know, say that a bit tongue in cheek, but I, in, in the years, what, nearly nine years I've been coaching and consulting to business owners, I think I could count on one hand the number of business owners that I've worked with that have actually been of the different mindset that they're not the best person to do everything. Yep. And and that's the first thing I think that people need to address, business owners need to address is the admission and the acceptance that I'm not the best person for every task in my business. Yep. And then it's a matter of stepping back and saying, okay, well, what are all the tasks in my business? What are all the things that, that need to get done? And starting to look at the difference between urgent and important tasks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know Michaela and I are on a bit of a, a two-person crusade around a particular book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. By the way, I downloaded that after speaking to you last week. <laughs> it's Not a convert. Done. It's yeah. on my iPad. It's, it's and, next and in you queue. know what? We get no Amazon uh, affiliate <laughs> fees for that book recommendation. I think we should hit hit uh, Gary Keller up. But you know, there's there's this distinction between urgent and important, and too many people get sucked into just doing urgent things all the time and not taking the time to step back and say, okay, what are all the important stuff, all the important tasks in my business that if I get them done and implemented are going to make other stuff less consequential? You, you think about, you know, you put time into business development or planning or, you know, marketing activities that attract some bigger, better contracts. The extra money you make from that, you can go and pay people to do all the other crap. Yep. I, sp- I suppose that kind of ties into the, the what, where I was leading with the next question is sort of how would you how would you uh, you know discover those strengths? Is it literally a case of just writing down all the things that you do and then trying to ascertain which ones are you know are considered urgent and critical and which ones are important? Well, yeah, and I guess it's looking at you as a business owner. You know, there may be some things that you don't like necessarily doing that you do need to do as a business owner, but there's also some things that you think you should be doing, but really you shouldn't. Yeah. And so it's about what are you focusing on those activities that are going to be revenue generating yeah. and trying to outsource or delegate the rest. So it's not necessarily just what you like doing because you may love doing um, accounts. Let's hypothetically say probably none out there, but that doesn't mean that's the best <laughs> the time. Oh, uh, I've had people say that. Yeah. I've had business owners that say, but I really like doing my own accounts. Jesus. So I don't care. Stop doing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's not necessarily what you like. It's what you should be doing that's going to grow the business and create more revenue and, and get to your long-term goals. So really, that's the main thing is starting out and then looking at everything else uh, that you do. And what can be really eye-opening is actually trying to measure your time that you do all week and you know actually going down to 15-minute increments or even an hour and just saying where your time goes every day. And I think you'd be shocked at how much time is really wasted yeah. that could be delegated or, or outsourced. So it's really identifying the important task because you know what the urgent stuff's always going to get done um, because it's urgent, but the important stuff always gets pushed back. So we're trying to promote this thing of doing the important stuff first and and getting the urgent done, you know, by the time it needs to be done. Yeah, okay. That's a good little framework there. Get the the important stuff done first. Urgent stuff can be outsourced. And uh, another way that you could look at that is also what I like to do with people is when you have a review of all of the stuff that you do in your week or your month as a business owner, Every time you pick something up, think about the hourly rate that you would pay someone to do that task, right? Mm -hmm. So if if we take that bookwork example or bookkeeping, you know, a decent sort of bookkeeper is anywhere between 40 and 60 bucks an hour, I guess, there or thereabouts. So as a business owner, you don't want to be touching things that are less than the desired hourly rate that you'd like to be making. And when I quiz business owners about this and say, okay, so how much do you want to make in a year from your business? You know, perfect world. Usually the number's pretty sizable. All right, well, how many hours a week would you like to work? Oh, well, 30 or 40, some say, some say 20. And just divide one, the first number by the second number and you come up with the required hourly rate that a business owner needs to generate. And generally speaking, the number is more than 100 bucks an hour, right? Yeah. It's usually up around two or $300 an hour that people really want to be generating for the amount of time they put into their business. So why are you picking up a $45 an hour bookkeeping task for 10 hours a week? How the heck are you ever going to get your income up if that's the sort of work that you're doing? Yep. And when they start to look at the tasks that they're carrying out and the hourly rate of an equivalent person that 
could do that task instead that then frees them up to go and work on the 100 or 200 dollar an hour jobs which is usually business development you know forging alliances coming up with new products reviewing their pricing doing a session with me you know <laughs> to work out where the, the wins are in their business but uh, and and the stuff that you know we're talking about with you today figuring out what they can outsource yep. for the rest of their team so that everybody's being more effective it seems as well like there's a bit of a I mean I don't know you, I mean, I'm sure you guys would have uh, way more experience in this field to me, but, than me, but I suppose I, I notice, you know, people are very happy to outsource certain tasks, but then more reluctant to outsource others. I mean, you know, most people are, are not really interested in building their own website, so they're happy to outsource that. However, you know, as you said before, you know, a lot of companies still want to hang on to things like invoicing or, you know, reconciling, stuff like that. Is that just a comfort thing that you think? Yeah, look, I definitely think it's a comfort thing. And I think things like getting your website and all that, I mean, if it's not your skill set, like, why, you know, a lot of these businesses try and make their own website when it's such a critical driver to their business, but that's a whole nother episode, which I'm sure you would talk about often. But with this, it is a comfort thing and it's also a cost-effective thing, they think. You know, often they say, oh, it's just cheaper if I, if I do it, mm. where really when you do the figures, it's not. And it's also, oh, I like doing it and I can do it quicker than somebody else. And so it's that whole mentality of, you know, letting go and the fear of losing control and, and all those other things that come with it. So it's just a matter of looking at, again, you know, doing the numbers really, and seeing where your yeah. time is best spent. And uh, usually other people, yes, they're going to cost you money, but they're probably going to do it a lot faster than you can do it anyway and more efficient and maybe improve your customer service, which gives you greater sales. So there's more of a long-term look at it as well. Yeah. I mean, that was going to be another question as well. Is it is it a cost thing? Like the people think, oh, well, you know, I can't really Oh, they think they can't afford to put somebody on to do something that's going to cost them $50 an hour, whereas in reality, it's probably costing them a lot more to do it themselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and the thing that they don't do is, and I see this happen as well, is they have the presence of mind to go out and get a bookkeeper to stick with that example. But then the time that they get back, they don't reallocate that in the best way possible. So now they've taken on the additional cost of a bookkeeper and they're not using the 10 hours a week that they got back any better than they were before. It just gets burnt on fluff or firefighting. And so that then becomes the argument that, oh, well, I got a bookkeeper and I'm, I'm no better off. Plus, I'm paying them more money. I'm still not making any more revenue. Well, that's because you didn't actually allocate your time effectively as you should have. Yeah. yeah okay. and- and the other, you know, example I like to give is, for example, having your phone answered. I mean, because I don't want to pay someone to answer my phone, but look at the way that, you know, your phone's always going to get answered professionally. You can, you know, implement an automated sales process, which improves your customer service, which gives you loyal customers. So not looking as actual cost to answer a call, but look at you want to invest in your customer service and the profile of your business. I mean, that's and, a big one, isn't it? Phones. Uh, don't get me started. <laughs> I mean, I know from, you know, back when I was, when I was a plumber, you know, if you're out there on the job and your phone's ringing all day, you, you, you find it hard to finish tasks, you know, on the, on the site while your phone's ringing. You can't not answer your phone. Yeah. And it's a productivity thing. I mean, imagine if you had no interruptions, you'd get the job done quicker and better. Yeah. Plus, you'd have better customer service at the other end. And there's so many phone answering services out there now that there's really no excuse why you can't implement some kind of um, phone or customer service outsourcing into a lot of businesses. And yeah. again, you know, cloud technology is making that so much easier. But I know that we we actually did a podcast episode um, where we rang 10 tradies just as an example. We didn't set it up or anything. We thought, let's just do this live and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, and only 30% of the calls that we made actually answered the phone and answered it properly, like saying who they were and what their business was. Right. They either didn't answer, went to a terrible voicemail or just said, you know, hello. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know. So, I mean, it's that first impression so important now. So, it, you know, there's these things that can get outsourced now that never used to be able to. So, more than just your accounts and things like that. And, uh, you know, your whole admin processes, your bookkeeping, all that kind of stuff now is, is quite easily outsourced. Yeah, and, and this is truly an entirely different topic. But I mean, the, I imagine that by outsourcing something like your phone service, it would make you a lot more accountable or it would at least, I mean, the amount of people, I mean, I'm sure you guys deal with this all the time as well, the people that you would call who just either don't return your phone call, won't return your email. It's just it's just mind boggling for me, like people you're trying to help with business, you know? Yeah, yep. Does, does my head in. 
Anyway, okay. Well, look, I think that pretty much um, wraps up what I wanted to speak about here. Do you think, have we missed anything there, guys, in, in relation to discovering what your strengths are within your business? No, I think a lot of people either convince themselves or fool themselves into believing that they're no good at sales or no good at business development or that side of things. And there's a lot of fear behind it from a personal point of view of being you know, the one out there speaking about your business and dealing with customers. But it's amazing when once you get some processes in place for sales, you know, have a sales process and some scripts and all that sort of stuff. Business owners are very passionate about what they do. Um, you know, they believe in their product or service. So yeah. they're, they're usually the best person to be talking about it. I imagine as well, I mean, as a bit of a wrap up here, you know, if you can, I mean, you touched on it was, but if you can understand what it's actually going to cost you to perform that task, that might yeah. put a bit of perspective on, you know, the uh, the pros and cons as to getting somebody else to do it for you. Absolutely. Who could probably do it 10 times better. Yep. And there's also that, you know, keeping the family and partners happy and spending more time with the kids. So there's all that lifestyle costs as well. I think it's important to factor in yep. as well. All right. Beautiful. Well, let's wrap this up and we will have you come back for the next episode shortly. Cheers, Thanks. mate. Thank you. So if you haven't already, head across to the siteshed.com and register for our toolbox talks where you'll be regularly sent great episodes just like this straight to your inbox so you'll never miss one. Uh, if you want to join the community, you can head across to the siteshed.com forward slash members where for a small monthly fee, you'll get access to regularly updated training material as well as access to our forum where you can mingle and collaborate with trade-based business owners just like you from all over the world. If you're enjoying this podcast, please head across to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. We greatly appreciate it, and it helps us spread the word and reach the masses. Likewise, if you know anyone that might benefit from the content we create, then please go ahead and share this with them. You've been listening to Toolbox Talks by The Site Shed. For more great content just like this, head across to thesiteshed.com and join the amazing community of savvy trade-based business owners.